Our story takes place in Bel Air, Ohio, a quaint community with a population of right around 4,000 souls. On May 7th, 2017, a few of those souls headed over to their friend Brad McGarry's house. David Kinney, his wife Sherry, and their 13-year-old daughter arrived at Brad's home intending to return a weed whacker and hang out. The family was really close with Brad. He was considered an uncle to the children and the family regularly spent time together on the weekends. Anyway, they arrived at Brad's home. His vehicle was in the driveway, but when they knocked on the front door, there was no answer. Then David asked the 13 year old to go around to the back and knock on that door. Also, no answer. So David decided to try the doorknob and it opened. So he and his whole family went into the house calling out to Brad, looking for Brad. And they then ventured down to the basement where in utter shock, they saw Brad laying in a large grotesque puddle of blood and Sherry was the one to call 911 and she asked their daughter to get out of the house, get out now while she was on the phone. And, you know, this had to be so traumatic to the whole family. Anyway, Sherry was hysterical as she was saying, "Uh, my friend is dead. My husband's best friend is dead. He's laying here dead. And 911's asking her for some details and then said that she and her husband should also back out of the house and wait for the authorities to arrive. Well, the authorities arrived and they talked with David and Sherry, who were obviously distraught, just beside themselves. And so the authorities went in to check out the scene. And what they observed was that the house had been kind of ransacked. Drawers were open, pulled open all over the place, and there was a lot of disarray. And then they went down into the basement, and there was Brad in the blood. And so law enforcement had two theories right there at the get-go, which was maybe a robbery because of the disarray, and maybe because there's this guy deceased in the basement all alone. And at the time he hadn't been moved yet. So they had to rule out uh, that he took his own life. So they talked to David and Sherry and asked whether you know there was any problems with this guy's love life or anything like that. Was he battling depression? And they said that he had broken up with someone a while back and hadn't been dating anybody else. And, uh, First, the police asked, you know, what's her name? And then David and Sherry both said, oh, no, it's a guy. And so they said the guy's name was Scotty. So the police went over to Scotty's house, encountered his mom, who said that Scotty had been in jail for the past three months. They decided Scotty didn't have anything to do with it. Of course, they were able to rule out that Brad had taken his own life uh, as soon as they moved him because there was no weapon there. And so obviously someone had done this and had removed the weapon from the scene. Then there was the burglary angle and they noted that there was no sign of force entry and there didn't appear to be anything missing. There was money and cell phones and stuff available in the house laying around there were expensive belongings of brad's and brad was an art collector and uh there didn't appear to be anything missing not even brad's own firearms which you know if it was an actual burglary you would expect something to be missing nothing missing so hmm what do you think happened well They then went and spoke to Brad's family and other friends of his. And in this, they discovered quite a bit. Brad was a 43-year-old man, and he had lived in Bel Air for 
I don't know, close to a decade prior to this, he actually had become a hairdresser for a while. But as I mentioned before, he liked collecting art objects and stuff like that. And he decided that being a hairdresser was not going to cut it. It wasn't going to bring in the kind of cash he wanted. So he decided to become a coal miner. And in the course of being a coal miner, he bought his house there in Bel Air and settled right in. At the time of his death, he was a foreman. Another thing that the police decided to look into was they went, well, could this possibly be some sort of hate crime because coal mining, etc. They wondered whether there was any animosity amongst the co-workers towards him. And, you know, they went and checked that all out and nobody wanted Brad dead. So they went and talked to his family and were retracing his steps. On that Saturday, the day before he was discovered dead, Brad had gone to a, a wedding and he had hung out with family. He spent the night at his mom's house. And then on Sunday, he was having brunch and he was going to be returning the tuxedos and such and had a bunch of stuff from the wedding in his vehicle. And he was like giddy, face lit up as he's texting and, and talking with someone. And his cousin talked to the police about it and said that Brad's plan was after they ate, he was going back to his place and he was meeting up with DJ. And DJ was the love of Brad's life. He and DJ had been involved for a number of years and they were kind of like on and off because DJ was closeted, DJ was married, and DJ was a coal miner. And then, boom, the cousin let them know DJ's real name was David Kinney, David Jr., DJ. And so, armed with this information, the police talked to David on the pretext of, you know, maybe he had some photos on his phone or something that might help with the investigation. Dave agreed to come in and he gave them his phone. What he didn't know was that the law enforcement already knew about his relationship with Brad. And while they were getting the things out of the phone, Another thing that David didn't know was that they were able to get all the things that he deleted that he didn't want them to know, you know, all those secrets that were in the phone. And so David started the interviews going with the, the same old story of that he and Brad were best buddies, that they hung out and Brad was part of the family. The kids all called him Uncle Brad and that all of them were close, he, his wife and Brad, and that you know he was shocked to have found Brad deceased at his home. And he insisted that he hadn't been there earlier in the day at all, that you know he had just arrived there at 6.15 or so with his wife and his kid and and found Brad. Then the police confronted him with the fact that they believed there was something more to his relationship with Brad. And at first, David tried to deny it, but then confronted with the information that there was evidence in his phone that they were able to retrieve, he then admitted that he and Brad had fooled around. There was nothing going on at the time and that he didn't uh, take Brad's life, that he wasn't even there. But then they showed him the his phone, GPS, put him at Brad's home that afternoon. So then David said that he had gone to Brad's home, but Brad wasn't there, so he left because there was footage of him arriving in the area, Brad arriving in the area, and him leaving after Brad was there. Then his story changed again, you know, thanks to the neighborhood um, security cameras. So then the story became he was there at the house waiting for Brad. And then Brad showed up, but he had another guy with him. And then Brad and the other guy went into the house and then David heard gunshots and then David left. But he was scared and that's how come 
He didn't say anything before he went back to the house, you know, to the police or anything. I didn't know I killed him. I didn't know I killed him. So then the police confronted him with, well, why would you bring your wife and child in there to find Brad? And he's like, well, I didn't know anything had happened to Brad. And they're like, um, I don't believe you, sir. Next, he said that he was in the house when the shooting happened because uh, I forgot to mention that the police showed him the photos of the inside of Brad's vehicle and all the stuff that was in the passenger seat and, and whatnot. So it was obvious that no guy had arrived in Brad's car with Brad. So he changed the story to the guy was there. He went inside, he saw the guy and Brad get into an argument, and the guy killed Brad, and then threatened him with the gun, and then left. But there were holes in that story too. I'll tell you anything, I don't know what happened. What? Oh my God. What are you telling? Well, there's nothing I'm not telling you. So, a little more prodding, and eventually, he seized on the words maybe it was an accident so then david came up with okay okay i went to brad's house to see brad uh he was upset because he was missing some money and he was tearing up his house looking for the money and then he confronted me about leaving my wife and i told him i wasn't going to leave my wife and so then he got really mad at me and he pulled out this derringer and he threatened me with it and we got into a bit of a tussle and the gun went off and it was an accident etc guess what brad had been shot twice in the back of his head so that didn't cut it uh the police also were wondering how much sherry knew oh my god no Dude, what the hell's going on oh. <laughs> but when she was brought in and david talked to her and told her what had happened his version of what had happened her reactions were such that the police knew she had no idea about this going on and she was livid that he had brought her and their 13 year old daughter into the house knowing that brad was deceased knowing what they were going to find and uh, so david went to trial and he was convicted of first degree and he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Sherry still lives in Bel Air with the kids and she's keeping a low profile. And I wish her and the kids the best. It's terrible that they were betrayed that way and it's awful that Brad was also betrayed by the man he loved. At this point, I'd like to encourage you to comment and let me know what you did or did not like of this story or what you thought of this story. And also, please leave your DNA on the like button. It really helps me out. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next video.